um, because they have had the incredible power to raise the spirits of your loved ones. Well, you may have been skeptical, but just imagine that if you've been to, if you went to that meeting, you probably could be welcomed into the parlor of a nice home. You may have seen some of your neighbors there. Uh, the, the, the program would begin in darkness. Uh, and people would hold hands, and they, this was very much, by the way, related to the abolitionist uh, and, uh, movement. Uh, it was also at a time when, when many formal religions, Calvinism in particular, were losing their stead as the industrial age was picking up steam, literally and figuratively. And people were beginning to wonder whether we were living uh, in a world in which the old-fashioned religions really no longer spoke. But what did speak in that age, around 1848, was brotherhood, abolition uh, of slavery, uh, the freedom and the equalization equality of all souls. So uh, these meetings would begin with a prayer for all people and all souls. Now imagine that the lights were then dimmed even more and that suddenly the woman who would be the medium might sit for a moment and think and the room is completely silent and then suddenly she might speak out and it might be in a different voice and she might look at one of you. Aha! Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> She might be on the phone. And they did call it, by the way, since was, this was the age of, tel of the telegraph. If you think about Morse, this was the beginning of the telegraph. They did think that these women had really an instantaneous, we'll, we'll say wire uh, in those days, not telephone, uh, to uh, the other world. And suddenly, she might look at one of you and speak in this other voice, and she might say, Nellie, Nellie, I see you there. Well, you're looking very well. Nellie, but I have a question to ask you. This is your grandmother. Nellie, do you remember that hope chest that I gave you when you got married 45 years ago? And Nellie, you, I gave you a blue quilt that I had embroidered as a young girl for that hope chest. Nellie, I'm looking at you and I'm looking at your home. I don't see that blue embroidered patchwork quilt anymore. Where is it? Well, if you happen to be Nellie sitting in that audience, and only your grandmother would have known about that blue patchwork quilt, you can imagine that you would too would have been electrified. How could the medium who never you'd never set eyes on before in your life, or anyone else, have known about that quilt? Now that's just a small example of the kind of thing that was reported again and again and again. These are the unexplainables, and these were the hooks, if you will. This was the fascination with the beginnings of spiritualism. But there's something beyond the rise of science, which of course also began at that time in the, in the early and mid-19th century, something that we really don't quite understand. House where spiritualism began originated March 31st, 1848 near Newark, New York. This house was eventually moved to a spiritualist community about 100, 100 years later it burned down. But anyway, we'll come back to that. Another picture of Maggie Fox who becomes internationally known along with her younger sister Katie, uh, all because of this woman. Looks pretty formidable, huh? Well, this is Leah, their older sister, single mother, divorced, who was teaching piano lessons in affluent Rochester, New York, to the very wealthy people who lived there, and knew all about all of the new writings that had then gone on. Uh, uh, all about the new world and the new, the new sort of brotherhood and the new spiritual sort of breaking the shackles of old traditional religions. Um, and Andrew Jackson Davis was, uh, was the proponent of a best-selling book, which she no doubt had, had contact with, which was sold in Rochester at that time. She heard about this by reading about what happened to her sisters uh, and her parents in a newspaper in Rochester, and she came riding up to um, back to Hydesville to find out what it was. And she promptly took them to Rochester, put them on display. They went around and did seances in the homes of wealthy and prominent people for about a year. And uh, pretty soon the press got involved and they became quite famous. They were finally taken to this arena, Corinthian Hall in Rochester. Uh, and before about a thousand people, they performed these seances. And of course, the press, part of the press and the ministers, uh, were up in arms that this was all a fraud, um, that this was just one more trick, 19th century love tricks, 
19th century, didn't quite understand technology either, the technology of that time, so a lot of this was mysterious. In any case, Horace really, of the New York Tribune, got wind of this. He had reporters kind of scattered around New York State and other places, and before you knew it, uh, he had written them up in the newspapers, um, and also the, the, uh, the press flurry about them. Now, some people were threatening to um, lynch the girls because they were frauds, and they were taking the money of the innocent. See, things don't change much from one century to another, do they? Uh, but uh, Horace Greeley, uh, why are we going backwards? Yes, okay. Horace Greeley took them under his wing. He even had them come to New York, and he presented them to some of the most distinguished writers and philosophers and scientists of the day. And one of them, in particular, James Fenimore Cooper, who scoffed at this, was amazed when Maggie Fox and her sister suddenly took on the spirit of his sister, his own sister, who had been dead for 50 years, had died as a year, very young woman, maybe a teenager, in a horseback riding uh, accident. Nobody talked to him. He didn't ever talk about that. He became a convert. Of course, this is blasted all over the newspapers. And before you know it, you have a national movement of people crazed for spiritualism. And it was thought as part of this that the young soul is pure, not tainted by the world, and therefore child mediums, teenage mediums, particularly women, although some men, uh, had a special affinity and sensitivity to others and could had these powers to talk to dead spirits. The whole purpose in talking to dead spirits was never frightening or ugly or mean. It was meant to be loving and kind and reassuring. You might say it was kind of a therapy of the day for people who were grieving or felt regretful about some of those that they lost. When New York Academy of Music, Maggie Fox comes back from England having sort of rescued Katie's sons, but she's very troubled. She's now in her 50s, it's in the 1880s, and she decides that she has to tell the press something. She's revered at this point again, you know, the she's been again practicing spiritualism. <laughs> And she gets up before 3,000 people and the press, full press court, and she said she has a confession to make. It's all over the New York Herald and all the newspapers. And she then said, explains, first how she makes the wraps, then she takes off her shoe and shows them how she does it with her toes. And she declares that spiritualism is a fraud and that she has duped and her sister have duped people all of their lives, thousands and thousands of people, and she is ashamed. Now, she and her sister then go on a tour for a little bit. Uh, her sister can't complete the tour, but really her alcoholism is pretty bad. Maggie is supposed to get a lot of money for this exhibition that she did. Um, but within another year, Maggie contacts the head of the spirit, one of the many, well actually the, the New York Spiritual Society, and she said she has another confession to make to the press. What is it, Maggie? And so once again, the press are called, and she tells them that spiritualism is real, and that she is a spiritualist, there is such a thing, and that she asked her, why did you make this public confession at the New York Academy of Music? And she says, because I needed the money. So now the press is completely bamboozled. But as I say, the psychologists are beginning to look at abnormal personality, what they call split personality, and the beginnings of schizophrenia, and some of these other things. But they're also puzzled by what, in our time, we think of as parapsychology. So people like um, Clark, the psychologist, Freud actually begins to flirt with this too, although he finally stays away from it, uh, though some of his uh, disciples continue on with it. Maggie dies in uh, 1893. And the weird thing is a report from her nurse who said Maggie was so sick she couldn't, at the end, move her legs or feet. She really couldn't. But the whole place, her whole home, was filled with wraps of no explanation. Maggie is, is first buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn with her, with her hated sister, Leah, who married the head of the New York Fire Insurance Company, who's a spiritualist Underhill, and the Underhill uh, plots. But then her friend, and he was only a friend of fellow spiritualists, has her buried in Cypress Hill in Brooklyn, who has her grave there. Um, but Maggie leaves an incredible legacy. 